Hi, this is Nancy with On Point TV and Quilting with Nancy. Thank you for joining me for part two of the Invisible Machine applique. Um, sorry that the last one went so long. I hope that you really want, I hope you learned a lot. There was so much to learn because we did perfect circles. We did the um, interfacing turn technique like we would use on larger pieces. And we also did the leaves so that we had a lot of points. I did mention, though, that I had done a project quite a few years ago, and I had only used the interfacing turning technique, but I didn't have a picture of it. And I got a picture of it, and I'm just hoping it'll actually show up here. All right, so that is the picture. That was called the Blue Collection, and it was by a designer. Her name is Maggie Walker. Now, it was literally... 20, 20 years ago at least that I did that. I actually did it as a block of the month for people in the um, in the Grand Rapids area here for two years straight. They just were like, okay, let's just get together again. Let's just get together again. And it took quite a while. Now I want to show you some close-ups. So here's some close-ups. So do you see how those points are not very pointy? That's because I was using the interfacing technique where I sewed around the interfacing and turned it right side out. I didn't know about the other technique at that point. Um, but then here I used some of the bias stems that we'll do a little bit today. But the big pots, those were perfect to use with the interfacing technique. And then even like these little fishes. So it was a really super fun quilt to do. But... I didn't have all the techniques in my pocket that I wished I had had at the time so that I could have really done a maybe a more amazing job on it because I really love that quilt. The picture that I showed you, the first one, that's it hanging in my living room. It's been hanging in my living room for, um, I don't know, we've been in this house for 20 years, so it could be there for 20 years. Occasionally, I'll take it down for Christmas. You just kind of never know. So we're going to continue now, and I want to show you another one that I've been working on. Oops, got to bring this over. Close your eyes so you don't get dizzy. I learned that from my friend Donna. She always says that when she has to move a camera. She's actually here. I've got a live studio audience here today. All right, so this is the other, one of the other designs in the book. Oh, guess what? The book is printed. So the book has been available for an e-pattern on the website, www.onpoint-tv. And now it's available in print because we are a week delayed from when I had wanted to do this second part because, you know, we had a bad storm in West Michigan. And when we have a storm, Bill and Nancy lose power. But we do have a generator now. That was pretty cool. So this is the book available on the website. It is full color with all of the designs and all of the techniques that, you, that I'm teaching you here if that will help you having the pattern already printed for you. This is one of the designs and I did want to mention to you one thing about using perfect circles. So on this design I chose to use a dark background and the you can't see it because I kept trying on the um to see if I could see what I'm seeing in real life. But if you put a circle like this on a dark background, you can actually see the shadowing of the seam on the back. And so there is a dark circle right in the middle. Well, when that happens, take another piece of the same fabric and kind of tuck it in. I cut this a little bit smaller than the actual perfect circle was. And then when you glue it down over here, I'd glue it down over here, then you won't see that shadowing through it. Also, I don't recall last time if I mentioned the idea of drawing your outside lines. So this block will trim down to 18 inches. This line is drawn at about 17 inches. You always want to be sure that you've drawn your line so that you don't accidentally, you know, get a flower all the way out here to the edge and then you end up cutting it off and crying because, you know, you lost part of your design. Okay, so we are going to go, oops, I keep moving it before I click it. All right, the techniques that we're going to start with today or technique that we're going to start with today is the stems, making the perfect stems. Now, if you watched any of my Learning to Quilt series or the quilted tiles, in the quilted tiles and the Learning to Quilt, 
I teach you how to fold the fabric in such a way that you end up with lots and lots, like miles and miles of bias stems to do applique work. So with the quilted tiles, it's designing all these really cool different tiles. In the learning to quilt, it's making the cool cable. Well, with these quilts, like the one here, these are just smaller, shorter stems. Not one of them really is longer than maybe 18 inches. So you don't really have to have that big, huge half yard of fabric with all the fancy fold. Instead, you can do it in smaller sections. So this is how we're going to do it. We're going to use one of two tools. This is my favorite no melt press bar. These come from Collins. And then they discontinued them. I about just cried my little eyes out. And that day, my friend Laura at Fireside Quilts went to every single possible distributor on the planet and bought up everything they had. So she still has quite a few of these. And honestly, if I were you, that's what I would go and buy. These are my favorite. They do everything that I need them to do. If you can't get these, the next best is the clover loop tools. Now I don't have the package anymore for this one, but these come, they're a green and it comes in five colors. Now what I do like about this is in the Collins, this is the largest size that's a half inch. In the clover, this is like three eighths of an inch. So if you wanna make really, really big ones, then you're, you want to get the clover. With the clover, the other thing that it has is this little kind of tricky slot here. And the idea is that when you're finished um, with your tube, with the pressing like I'm going to show you, you can put like a cable or a piece of fabric or something like that in it and then pull it through the cable to actually make puffed up loops. I've never done it. I think I could probably figure it out, though, if I try it. So we're going to start with this demo. We're going to make a big one today. So this is the half inch. And I've got a not huge piece of fabric. So this is, I'm going to say this is nine inches. Let's see. Yep, nine inches. So this would be a quarter of a yard. And I'm going to cut a bias strip. You know what? I haven't said hello to anybody yet. Hello, people from Michigan everywhere today. Lansing, and I don't know where Zella is, but Sharon's up at the Bear Lake. Hello, Michigan. And yes, did you guys get the storms too? And did you run out of power? Because I did. Okay, so I'm putting this down on this nine inch piece of fabric, and I'm lining it up on the diagonal. Does it have to be a perfect 45? Do I have to actually look at this perfect 45 and line it up? No, it doesn't really need to be a perfect 45. It just needs to be on the diagonal so that you get bend, and then you cut. When doing this, I told you that we don't need super long ones. These stems, not one of them is more than 18 inches. This is going to give me a 13 inch, if I slide this all the way down, I'm going to be able to cut a 14 inch, one and a half inch wide strip. And that's the size that I need for this half inch bias bar. Now keep in mind, if you are making a smaller one, like the quarter inch, then you can cut a one and a quarter inch strip and then do trimming on it. But for this one, I'm going to do this big, large guy. All right, let's get these guys out of the way. And now we are going to go to our sewing machine. Now at the machine, I've got just my regular foot on, but I do have my quarter inch guideline here, and that is going to help me so much with the piecing of this um, little stem. So this is what the, there we are, the seam guides. These are from Guidelines for Quilting. Remember, they don't sponsor me. I buy my own, and I'll keep buying them forever because I love them that much. I'm just using my regular foot, got my guidelines here, and you know how with our fancy machines, we can move our needles to the left and to the right. And then I have comments from people going, I can't do that, why are you doing that? I need to know how to do it without being able to move my needle from the left to the right. All right, today is the day. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this stem, I'm going to roll down by hand my needle. So it's down into the machine. I'm gonna line up, I'm pushing the stem so it's going to the left, butting right next to the needle, and then put my guideline right there next to it. Now I can remove this, and now I know how big my seam needs to be. 
So I'm going to take my strip of fabric here. Whoops, it's a little bit dark there. Um, well, it is what it is. I'm going to have to continue going anyways. Okay. And on my piece of fabric, let's see, can I get a better? There we go. I'm going to line it up so the good side of the fabric is on the outside. So this would be wrong sides together, knowing that there's not really a wrong side or a good side or a right or wrong side to your fabric. It's just the side of the fabric that you want to see. The side you want to see needs to be on the outside. And then when you're sewing it, the fold is here to the right. And I'm going to place my finger right here on my guidelines so that I can keep that fold right next to the guideline. So then I know that my tube is going to be the same size. I need my seam allowance to be ish. It does not need to be a perfect seam allowance. So for instance, as I'm coming here, do you see where it's off a little bit here? I'm going to sew it off like that. And I'm going to be oh so okay with that. All right, let's get that lined up there a little bit. All the way to the end. Yeah, I lost a little bit of the seam at the end. I was going a little bit crazy. Okay. Now coming back, this is my stem. So here, yeah, I maybe went a little bit too far off there just to show you that I could. But right here, where it's only that far off, that part is still totally usable. The next thing you do is trim this, to, not too narrow. When you are doing the smaller stems that are very narrow, you need this little trimming, this seam allowance, to be about an eighth of an inch. But with this big guy, you don't really need to. It can be a quarter of an inch or so because it's still going to hide really well behind. Ugh. There, I'm going to cut off that last part that was no good. All right, throw some trash away into my piles of stuff. All right, now this part's going to be a little bit tough because I have my cutting mat here, and I want to try to protect my cutting mat. So I'm going to put two layers of insulation down because this is my big cutting mat, and I really don't want it to get all whooshy on me. Okay, I'm going to get my iron. Okay, let's put that baby there. That's my Oliso iron. People are always asking about that. That's an Oliso. That means that it stands up all by itself. Okay. Now I'm taking my bar, and I'm going to take this the quilt the piece that I made the bias stem that I made, and I'm going to push it onto the bar. Now I want you to see where the stitching line is and where the seam is. So my stitching line is not at the very top of the bar. My stitching line is about an eighth of an inch below the top of the bar, and the seam is coming toward me with the idea that when I look at it from the other side, I don't see either one of those things, okay? And now I'm just gonna take, and I literally am shoving this onto the bar, okay? There, all right? Now it's all shoved onto the bar, now I press it. As it's coming off the bar, I press it, and I'm using my left hand to push more of the gathering off, and then move my iron over. Push more of the gathering off, and then move my iron. Okay? And you want to be patient with this. If your bias stem is too tight on your bar that you feel like it's stretching it, then you need to adjust your seam guide so that it's not. You want it to be just, I, I mean, I wish I knew what the perfect word was to tell you that it is the right um, fit on the bar. You want it to fit not too snugly and not too loose because if it's too loose, then it's like those pair of jeans that you put on and you sit down and you stand up and then you got baggy butt and we hate that. Um, but then if it's too tight, then it's all stretched and then it looks like, you know, a sausage and jeans that are too tight. There you go. I said it, all right? So there is my bias stem. Let me put my iron away and get the pressing out of the way. There we go. That worked. I did not melt my surface. Now I have a bias stem. Now that bias stem would then be glued down, and I'm just going to choose this design, onto your design. All right? So it's just anywhere you want. Usually these ends you want to tuck underneath your flowers 
somewhere in the quilted tiles quilt if you go back to those videos i talked to you about weaving them and creating all these really cool celtic designs there is so much that you can do with bias stems it needs to be one of those techniques in your in your toolbox you need to know how to do the bias stems whoops Move too fast. So on this design here, I used a couple of different sizes. I used some narrower ones and medium ones, and I even used a striped fabric, which FYI, you can't really see it there. Striped fabrics on the bias, on a stem, the coolest thing ever. All the people, are, you're going to be the cool kid on the block when you do that, okay? Um, on the butterflies, I used the quarter inch. Oh, and these designs, the butterfly designs, and this one down here, they are not in the applique by machine book. Those are the designs that are in the Learning to Quilt book, all right? So those are, there's five of the applique designs available in the Learning to Quilt book. So if you're interested in those, that's where they are. And you don't have to purchase the whole book. You can actually just purchase that chapter that has those designs in it, if that's what you want to do. Now, one other thing in the design, in the book rather, are some wreath designs. There, all right? When you have a wreath design, if you want, you could make that little circle be all squirrely and make them be wherever you want. But the easiest way that I know of to get a perfect circle for a wreath design is to go and get a plate in the kitchen. Get a plate, put it down, draw a circle, you're done. Then you know, you know, that it's kind of sort of circle. And with that, again, you don't need one big, huge, long stem. You can just use short stems that are then hidden underneath each of the flowers. All right. So the next technique, well, after you get this done, oh, the next thing you need to do is actually stitch it down. So we're going to do that on this design. All right. So we're going, I'm going to have to go to my machine. Um, so before I go to my machine, let me tell you how I use, what I use for this. So first I'm going to use invisible thread. So this is a Mani, you can't see that, can you? There it is, Mono Poly, and this is by Superior Threads. This is a really good invisible thread. Um, this one happens to be polyester. But what's most important is this little guy here, size 0.004. The Sulky is 0 .004. The YLI is 0 .004. The Superior is 0 .004. The, there's a couple of other ones that are 0 .004. And I am never going to be one to bash a manufacturer of anything. Everybody can make whatever they want. But there is one brand out there that their invisible thread is not 0 .004. It's like four. It's so thick. And that is the Gooderman Invisible. All right, Gooderman thread is what Gooderman thread is, but when it comes to their invisible, they have not created one fine enough. So when you're looking for invisible thread, look for the Superior really, really great one, the um, Sulky, YLI, any of those. But there are different styles, and I, I don't know where my cone is right now. Actually, it might be over there by you, Donna. My cone of invisible thread. Hey! See there, it's good to have an assistant in the studio. All right, so this is the cone and this is a spool. If you are using the cone, you can. it is best if you do not lay it horizontally on your machine. So if your machine can only use thread horizontally, then this is not the thread for you. You want to use the sulky or the superior that is actually on a spool because these can be used laying down horizontally. The one on the cone, which this is by YLI, and there's another manufacturer that I can't for the life of me think of the name. These ones, the thread needs to go up. So on my icon, I have a spool holder that goes up, but you might need to get yourself a, an external thread guide that makes the thread come up off of the spool if that's what you have. Mm -hmm. So invisible thread is the first thing. The next thing I'm going to use is a fine weight polyester thread in the bobbin. Now this happens to be Superior's bottom line thread. It's a 60 weight thread and it works just super fabulous for the bottom when doing invisible machine applique. If you do embroidery, then you might have that really, really fine weight 
um, that you put in the bobbin, and that works too. I just, I don't do embroidery, so I don't have those little pre-wound guys. And actually, I don't think my icon can use a pre-wound bobbin, which is kind of a bummer. Yeah. Yep, I could wind it under another bobbin. But this is what I use, so, okay. All right. Then the next thing is the needle. This is typically a needle that I'm going to use, oh, every day of the week. So this is a Microtex. This one is an 80. I like the 70s real well. But when it comes for invisible machine applique, you got to go fine. you got to go really fine. And can you see that? It's so small you can't see it. It's a 60 needle. And that is the finest needle that you can use in your sewing machine. It's so fine that I am not going to use it today because it takes me too long to thread the machine. So in my machine, I think there is a 70. And that's what I'm going to use for this demo because otherwise I just can't do it. All right. Don is laughing at me like, come on, people. What do you mean you can't thread your machine? It is tough. All right. So I'm going to take out the thread that's in there. I'm going to put in my invisible thread. And, you know, the cool thing about invisible thread is that it's invisible. And so when you're doing techniques such as this, or if you're um, trying to do some free motion quilting or in the ditch, I have a whole thing about in the ditch quilting and that it must be done with invisible thread. Um, but the bad thing about invisible thread is that it's invisible. But woohoo! My needle threader threaded it. I am a happy, happy girl. All right. I'm going to take off my regular foot, and I'm going to put on my open, whoops, open toe applique foot. There it is. Why? Because I want to see what I am doing. And if I don't have my open toe applique foot on, I can't see it. Let me take off my pin cushion so I will quit making everything so dark. All right. So I'm going to start working. Oh, and then my zigzag stitch. I am going to work with a zigzag stitch that is a 1.2 wide and a 2.0 long. That is what I am going to use. But that might not be what you can use. You have to use what you can see. If you cannot see on your machine the needle moving to the left and to the right doing the zigzag, then you have to make your stitch bigger so that you can do it. It makes no sense for you to be doing what I can do if you can't see what's happening. Now, I want to start here with this leaf because this little leaf here, he had been glued down, but I need to stitch the stem here. And I have found that instead of stitching the stem, stitching the stem, getting here to the leaf, doing a backing stitch, cutting it off, come, jumping over to the other side, starting it up again, and then continuing, because these are just glue basted down, I just lift it up out of the way. Okay. So I'm doing a zigzag and I'm doing a little bit of a back stitch and then continuing on. Now I have intentionally slowed my machine down. This is all the faster I go. Oh, you know what else I forgot to mention? You might notice that I have the, uh, maybe you don't notice because I can't see it. Nope, you can't see it. All right. I have my big acrylic table on so that I have a big surface to be working on. If you have one of those or if your machine is sunk down into a table, you're going to like doing this so much better. It just makes it so you can kind of spin your work really nicely. So it is going to do zig on, zag off, and no faster than this. You also want to be very cautious that you do not try to force the turn. The only time I turn is when the needle is down and then I can turn. Then I put the presser foot back down and then I stop. When I stop, I can turn. Do not try turning while you're moving. If you do, oftentimes you will end up getting wrinkles in your applique and that's just not very fun at all. And when I get to the end of this, going nice and slow, did a slight turn there and that's all right. Going to do a little back stitch and then cut it off. Okay. Then I could come back and do the other side. Then I could put the leaf down and then the leaf, because I'd already done here, I lifted up the leaf so I could do the applique around the flower. Then I can put the leaf down and do the applique right on top of the flower. It just makes it a little bit easier instead of having to do all these little starts and stops along the way. 
All right, so that's the stitch. The stitch, invisible machine, size 60 needle. And you know, the funny thing is, you notice that when I showed you my size 60 needle, like the writing was all rubbed off of it. I've had this pack for a long time, and I do a lot of sewing um, because they last a long time because the only time you can use a size 60 Microtex needle is if you have invisible thread in your machine. That's it. Um, and not even when you're doing quilting because it really is too fine for doing the quilting. Now, if you were stitching with silk thread, I guess maybe then you could. But for the most part, I only use mine when I'm doing invisible applique like I'm doing today. So a pack of 60 needles will last me quite a long time. All right. So we've got our entire process, our entire project all put down. The next step is the super cool scallop border. So let's bring this over and go overhead. Now, I would actually trim this down. I would probably take my ginormous, my ginormous OmniGrid ruler, and I would square that up to the 18 or 18 and a half inches. It really is up to you when you get there, but this one, yeah, that would make a really nice 18 and a half inch design. Just be sure that you've know, got the equal amounts on the top and the bottom and the two sides so that your um, design is actually centered. And if you don't have one of those really big ones, that was on my uh, quilter's favorite tools for Christmas thing. So you might want to reference that or better yet, find that video and make your family watch it for you. Say, and now watch Nancy, because this is what I want to have. It's somebody else from Michigan, Oakley, Michigan, and Hastings, Michigan. Hey, you Michigan people, any chance you're going to the, um, the Fiber and Quilt Show in Port Huron coming up the beginning of October? I will be there, and over there on the east side of the state, that'll be really fun. All right, so step one, got to get all my stuff out of the way. Let's straighten up our camera a smidge. There we go. Step one is to get your freezer paper and cut the freezer paper so that it is as long as your, as wide as your design. So in this one, this is my design from here to here, plus however wide you want your border to be. So I wanted my border to be this wide. I'm going to guess that's maybe five inches. I'm not really sure to tell you the truth. So that's how long of a piece of freezer paper you want to cut. So here in Michigan, we have Meyer, And so I send, you know, when Bill does the groceries, he'll say, what do you need for groceries? And I'll be like, avocados and some eggs. And pick me up a pack of freezer paper, please. And that's where we get our freezer paper from. And it is like 18 inches wide. There's a lot of things I use this for. But for this, you're going to cut a long piece. So this is the 18 inch wide. As long as your design is, plus however wide you're going to make your borders. Then you're going to fold that long strip four times. So I folded it in half. Zoom. I folded it in half again, zoom, and now I'm going to fold it in in half long ways. This extra leaf laying around here like you must belong to somebody. Okay. Now, just like when I did the leaves that we were doing multiples of leaves, I want to staple this uh, there so that it does not move when I'm doing the next step. The next step is to draw the design. Now I've already, I don't want to draw it for that one. I'm going to draw it for that blue one that I was doing. So I haven't done one. I think the fabric I have is for that one. So, okay. So let's say this is the design that I'm adding the scallop border to. Place the fold in the middle of the design. So yeah, maybe that's the middle. Let's see. Close enough. There's my design, and it's going to go all the way out to here. And this would be, if you will use your ruler, and actually draw a 45-degree angle. So from, I'm saying from the corner of this design, and my design would be trimmed down at this point. I have not trimmed this one down because I have not stitched it yet. You don't trim until you stitch. Now I am lining up the 45-degree angle of my ruler on the bottom of my paper, 
this is the corner of my design and I'm gonna draw a line right there. I wonder if you guys should see that or, yeah, you can see that, all right? That tells me that that's where my miter is gonna go and when I come back to the other camera, I'll show you some of the ideas. And now I'm gonna draw a nice curvy line. Yep, that's just what it's called. Nothing fancy, nothing like, you know, Michelangelo-ish, just a nice curvy line. There we go. That is going to be the design for my scallop border. Everybody's scallop border is uniquely theirs. There's Because in the book, I don't have a drawn scallop border. I mean, you can see the ones that I've done, but you do not get a pattern because everybody's has to be unique. All right, now I'm going to get my staple remover. I'm going to remove at least that one because I'm going to cut that. All right. I'm not going to cut that, but I'm going to cut these little guy here. So let's take, this is on the fold of the scallop. I'm going to cut that off eh, about an eighth, eighth of an inch or so. I'm going to use my bigger rotary cutter because I'm going through eight layers of paper. Oh, hello, Texas. Thank you, Ann. All right. So I've cut off the bottom, so now this is all raw edge. Now again, I'm going to use my big rotary cutter, and I'm going to cut that design, trying to be as smooth as possible. And if I change the design by the way my rotary cutter is going, so be it. All right? This is my design. Now I can take out this. I now have four pieces of freezer paper that are exactly the same that are going to create the four borders on this quilt. Now let's go to the ones that I have prepped. Okay. Now I've got my fabric for my border. Here's this and this is going to be the border. Is that the one I just did? Okay, good enough. All right. So this is the fabric that is my background to the scallop border. So for instance, on this one, it was the dark green and then I have this cool funky stripe that I used for the scallop. All right. Oh, there it is. See, I do have one done. And there's the design. Yes, okay, I'm glad I found it. That's the one I just created. Okay. So I'm gonna take my background piece and this is what will be my scallop. Um, let's move that all out of the way. Because now we got to bring our extra sturdy ironing surface back in. There. And I've also got here my Mary Ellen's Best Press. Okay. Going to take that strip of fabric. And I'm going to press the freezer paper onto the back side of this piece of fabric that I've chosen. Matching up the center. And I'm also matching up the raw edge down at the bottom. And then I'm going to press it to the back of the fabric. So, Linda, I will be in Texas in the end of October at Quilt Festival. Actually, I'll be at Quilt Market, too, so maybe I'll see you down there. Okay, so that is all pressed. Now I need to trim away the fabric. So i got to keep going back and forth to, from my cutting to my... Okay, I had a smaller cutting surface here somewhere. <laughs> Donna, can you hand me my circular one? Thank you, assistant. <laughs> All right. So we're going to take and trim this out. So you can use just your smaller rotary cutter at this point, and you can trim that. I'm going to go a little bit closer to be about a quarter of an inch from the edge of the freezer paper. It's maybe looking a little bit more like a half inch, but that's okay. It'll work.
There. Okay. Now this is honestly what I think is the hardest part of this whole thing. I don't know, maybe not hard. It's not the hardest part. It's the most time consuming part. Is that you have to clip your inside curves and you got to make lots of them. So it's not just like, you know, a half inch apart curves. If it's a pretty steep curve, you need that to the um, little clips to be at least a quarter of an inch. So pretty darn close. All right? And you got to do them on all of them. Do, do, do. And then when you're doing four borders, that just seems to take a while. And you got to keep the freezer paper there because of the, for the next step and because you want to be sure that you're not clipping too far in. So don't be too bored as I'm doing this, okay? Actually, I don't think I'm going to get to this curve, so I don't think we need to finish that. Okay. All right. Now, again with my iron. And this is much easier when I'm on my big ironing board and I've got, you know, my big flat surface. Now I'm going to use my Mary Ellen spray sizing, and I'm going to spray it. I am not misting it. I am spraying it wet. And I wish you could actually see. Do you see how it's actually saturating the freezer paper? It is wet. And that's the way I want it. Take the steam off on your iron and you are going to very gently fold the fabric over the cur the edge of the freezer paper. And it's so, you know, because these inside curves Inside curves are the easiest things. So now I'm going to dry this all the way. All right. And be sure that you do this all the way. Don't be, you know, thinking it's dry enough. Dry is dry, like completely dry. Um, you can't rush this when you're doing it. Okay. So you can see there how it's all, see how those little clips get wide there? Now I'm coming to another point. So at this area, I'm going to again use my spray sizing and then fold it over on that little tip. You don't have to do the flat fold like I do on the leaf to get that super sharp point. It'll work out just by folding it over. So this is how you create the scallop border. It's really very, very simple. It's just a matter of you being brave on your design going, yes, I can create a curved line. Everybody, raise your hand and say, I can create. Why clip? Because if you don't clip, so here on this one here, this one here is the one I did not clip. If you don't clip, you cannot get that to actually come down into the curve and give yourself a smooth edge. You've got to clip so that the fabric is able to, actually able to fan out here to give you a smooth curve on the other end. And that's just something as a seamstress that I've always done. When you've got inside curves, you clip them actually sometimes even when there's outside curves. So I hope that answered your question. Okay. You could take this class down in Texas with me, Linda, and then I'll show you in for real life. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to move my iron out of the way. Move my that guy out of the way. Oh, there's that smaller surface I was looking for. Duh. Okay. Next step is to take your design. I think I'm going to do it. Nope. Did I do it on that one? Okay. Nope. This is it. All right. So you're going to take your design using your Roxanne's basting glue. You're going to put dots of your glue here on the fold. Glue that down. So look at how cool that looks. I think it looks awesome, all right? And then you will do the same stitch that you just did to applique down your elements, just that small little zigzag all the way around. After you have done that, it's time to remove the paper. So the paper has stayed in while doing that stitch because now I can go to the paper, can peel it away from my fabric, And that stitch is so fine that the paper just comes right out. If you will leave that paper in, you will have a much easier time getting around 
the border. Look at that. So it looks so cool. And I absolutely love this, this striped fabric. I just think it turned out really, really cool. Hello, Sydney, Australia. Um, I believe it's cold where you guys are now, right? Because it's not real cold there. Uh, here, anyway. Okay, so now I'm going to take and put this onto the quilt. Now, when you are putting it onto the quilt, so let me move this mat out of the way so we're not having too much, like as if everything else isn't distracting enough, right? Yeah, let's give us a, yeah, I can't clear that away. Okay, so you're going to take this, and when you sew it onto the piece, you are going to stop a quarter of an inch from the end. So I sewed this one on and stopped a quarter of an inch from the end. Then on this other one, same thing. Fold that down. Stop a quarter of an inch from the edge. That is so that you will be able to make your mitered border. And I just, you know, this is like, now I can make a regular mitered border. You want to challenge me? You give me one of those old Jenny Byer border strips and I can make that mitered border so that those little designs match right up there in the corner and do it the real way. This is what I would call the cheater way, but goodness gracious, I don't know why we just don't do them all this way because it's so easy. There is border number one, pressed it toward the applique center. Here is border number two, pressed it toward the applique center. Line them up nice and straight, then fold one of them down until you get it folded square so you do want to maybe like grab one of your square rulers and be sure that it actually is still square on your quilt but you really want to match up that intersection and once you have that intersection matched up use your Roxanne's basting glue go dot 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 dot, dot and then do an invisible machine applique to get a perfect mitered corner with your scalloped border now, if you look, whoops, this one. Yeah, someday I'll figure out how I can, like, not have, anyway, so you're not all getting dizzy. So when you look at this scallop border, I like, really like very much having a point in the center, just because, don't know why, um, coming out and then going to a very sharp, sharp point there. And when you see this in real life, that baby matches up. That is just, can't get any closer than that. Over here, same idea. Did a really, really pointy point. Down here, this one's got like 1930s fabric with it. Um, here's another one here. So I've done quite a few different variations. See how this one is not pointy. And then I will get these three that I'm working on here done so that you'll be able to see what it is and I will post them. Um, so the scallop border, I love it because it's all you. There's no, you know, yeah, I showed you the technique. But that line is on you. You decide where that line is going to be and how it's going to create the cool border. I did mention earlier last time that, yes, you could make really, really long scallop borders. Like, you know, I don't know. Goodness. All right, maybe I'll try like a 40-inch one. Could this be done on a queen-size quilt? Yeah, but that's an awful lot of freezer paper. I just, I, just, I mean, you'd have to it'd be all, it, it's possible. Let me know how it works, okay? Because I'm not ready to do one on a queen size. I think maybe I could try one on maybe a 40 inch and, and let you know how that goes. So there you go. We're all done. We have done six different applique techniques with the fusible interfacing, with the Ricky Tim's poly stable stuff for doing the turned edges. We did the perfect circles. We did the bias stems. We did scallop borders and we did miters on our scallop borders. I think that's an awful lot to have accomplished in just, well, okay, two videos. The book is available. Go to the website if you want the print it. Well, either one, whether or not you print it or if you want the e-copy. Of course, it's less expensive if you do the e-copy. Um, and then you only want to print what you want. You don't have to print everything if you don't need to. Is there any questions? All right, I'm looking here. 
Well, if there are, put the questions in the comments, and I always answer those comments. It's very, you know, yeah, I'll just do a thumbs up if it's just something nice, but if you got a question, I will answer your questions. And if you don't want to put it in the comment section, you can send me an email. My email is quiltingwithnancy at gmail.com. Really easy to remember. Please give me a thumbs up if you like this one, and if you don't like it, then stop watching right now. Stop. Don't watch any more. Okay, um, and subscribe to the channel. Hopefully you're getting, clicking on those notifications. So like when Helen woke up in Australia, she got that notification so she knew that she could click on the video and start watching. This obviously be on our YouTube channel here in just a little bit. And then you could rewatch the whole thing a hundred times if that's what the Spirit told you to do. That's all I got for you today. Have a great day.